Hi, I'm Dr. Ken Owen at Pierce College with Music Off the Record. We're going to be talking about the composers uh, that will be on our concert for the Northwest Sinfonietta that's coming up. Now, we're going to talk about Mozart for this concert, of course, one of everybody's favorite composers, but did you know his actual full name? There it is. I'm not even sure I want to try to pronounce it. Um, most of those names we don't even usually listen to. He is, of course, the most famous child prodigy. Now, if we've watched, if you watched some of these videos before, a lot of the composers that uh, become the great composers that orchestras play were great child prodigies, every bit as much as Mozart. So why is Mozart the big icon? Why does Mozart get so much more attention for being the child prodigy than uh, so many other composers? Well, I think it's in large part due to his father. Well, it was his father who not only taught him, though Mozart caught on uh, incredibly quickly, but it was his father that arranged for these tours all over Europe playing for the royalty and, and things that, that that discussed. So the little image there of, of Mozart and his father and perhaps his sister or I don't know who else singing there. But uh, so of course he's the famous child prodigy. He does travel all over Europe. He plays everywhere. Everybody knows the name Mozart, certainly in the aristocratic circles. But what happens to a child prodigy when they're no longer a child? Oh, we uh, we kind of see the same thing happen with child actors today, right? Often, they, as soon as they're not the child actor anymore, they, they struggle to have a successful career. And such was the case with uh, Mozart. He has a little post-prodigy part in blues. He's no longer the famous celebrity kid. He's just expected to be a normal musician now. And at the time that we're talking, in the mid to late 1700s, musicians are not celebrities. Usually that was kind of weird, and it was only because he was the, the cute little child doing these amazing feats. Uh, Musicians as a whole are the servant class. This is something that the royalty hires to make the music for them, just like they hire the chef to make their food. And they are a servant and they do what they're told. So now suddenly Mozart is supposed to just be another musician in Salzburg, just like his father in the same orchestra with his father doing pretty much the same job. He didn't like this idea. He did go off and travel through Paris for a little bit with his mother this time, trying to find a job conducting a big orchestra, but didn't get any. Um, had a hard time there. So he's stuck in Salzburg. But the thing is, Salzburg's not a bad place. It's a, it's a good place for a job for a musician. It's provincial, yes. It's a fairly small town compared to things like Vienna, but it's a very wealthy small town. It's a good middle-class job for a musician, and those were hard to come by. It is part of the court patronage system, meaning that we have royalty giving you a good uh, salary, a good paycheck there. Um, it was actually interesting, church combined with royalty, it was the Archbishop of Salzburg was the, the royal governing person as well. So Mozart is in the orchestra as a violinist like his father and is expected to do some composing. Uh, Mozart's used to a little more attention than this and he has certainly much bigger ambitions. Even though he didn't get a job when he was on that trip to Paris and other places, he still has big plans that he can go out and somehow make it bigger and better on his own. In fact, there's a quote of him saying, this is translated of course, that Salzburg is not the place for my talent. Um, the Archbishop could not pay me enough uh, for the salary in Salzburg. So there's just no way that you could pay me enough for, for me to want to stick around. On top of that, uh, Leopold, his father, is very controlling. He controlled his uh, you know, young touring career and, and he's having a hard time thinking of uh, young Mozart as an adult and letting go of those uh, strings. And of course, the Archbishop of Salzburg is very controlling as well. This is normal. This is kind of what royalty are like back then. And so um, Mozart wanted out. I, I don't have a uh, clip here, but if you're familiar with that movie, Amadeus, there is the wonderful scene that shows him uh, trying to break free of his employment. Probably didn't happen the way that movie depicts it, but I'm sure it was difficult because you couldn't just quit your job. As a servant, you had to get permission to leave. It was difficult. He manages it, though. He gets away. And yay, he's off to Vienna, a big place for music, and it's where he wants to be. Uh, he's, he's unemployed. He has no job. Usually a musician finds a job at a church, writing church music, or at the court, writing uh, for whatever His Royal Highness would like, whoever that Royal Highness may be. In Vienna, it would be the Emperor Joseph II. Um, you could also write for operas, for the opera houses, but often uh, they were doing more than one of those jobs. So he just shows up in Vienna and he has no job and he's going to be a freelance composer, try to just get people to pay him to write uh, for whatever they would like. This is uh, very unusual, uh, but at first he's quite successful 
Um, so it seems risky, but it, it works very well for us. The Viennese love him. There's a definite um, Mozart craze and a Mozart trend, and as he's successful, he becomes accustomed to a little bit higher standard of living and begins to spend a lot of money uh, on, his, uh, on his living for him and his wife and his child. Well, the Mozart craze wears off. The Viennese public says, yes, we've heard Mozart, we've heard Mozart, we've heard Mozart. Time to move on to something else. This makes it difficult for uh, Mozart to keep living in the way that they have become accustomed to. But the saving grace is that Mozart does manage to inherit some of that business savvy that his father uh, employed in, in uh, all those tours when he was a child. He realizes that the way to make some money is to put on the concerts himself. And uh, he began some subscription concerts, meaning just like you would buy season tickets to whatever professional orchestra in these days. Same thing, he says that there's going to be a whole season of concerts of my music and me performing, and you can buy some season tickets. Uh, and this helped him, sustain him for quite a while. And this, we have a lot of piano concertos and symphonies and other things that came because of that series. But unfortunately, the Viennese public still are, seem to just get tired of Mozart, want something else. So he can't keep that going over time. But outside of Vienna, he's still a little bit of a novelty, especially it seems he finds success in Prague. So a, a little map there, just so you can see uh, there towards the right in the middle is Vienna, uh, at the kind of top right corner of Austria, and Prague up kind of in the middle top of the Czech Republic. So he travels there quite a bit. It seems like not too big of a distance for us today, hop in the car, drive there in a few hours, but if you go ahead and tell Google to map it uh, for walking, we're talking a good 60 hours walk. So it's some significant travel for him to go there to Prague. And he may have been riding in a carriage rather than walking, but that may be a little more comfortable, but I don't think it was a lot faster. So uh, he travels there. Prague loves him. He makes some money, but Prague does not have a big enough uh, audience base to keep him going. And he realizes that, so he never moves to Prague, and he realizes that pretty soon he's got to get something going in Vienna, where the big classical music-loving public is, the people who will go to concerts and things. So he starts to plan some more big concerts to try to help him, because he's financially in trouble. Um, we have letters of him writing to friends and, and uh, asking for, for loans, for, for some help monetarily. So he seems to be planning a big concert in Vienna, uh, as well as a tour to London. We suppose that maybe his last three symphonies, 39, 40, and 41, were composed with these concerts in mind. Unfortunately, the concerts never happen. Mozart dies before those fruitions come to plan, and uh, these become his last symphonies. So you get to hear one of those symphonies at the upcoming concerts, and uh, you can bring some of your own favorite stories of Mozart.